Good afternoon. Thank you so much to all of you for being here today. My name is Catherine Young, and I serve as the Assistant Director for Policy and Engagement for the Cancer Moonshot. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. This month, the President proclaimed that March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And in recognition of this and remembrance of every life cut short by this devastating disease, we are here today to hear about the incredible progress we have made so far, but also to uncover the challenges and barriers that have yet to be removed. We are so grateful for all of our speakers who are with us, who many have traveled far distances to be here in this very rainy, typical DC weather. And we are so excited to have a full and robust program with you covering topics from screening, prevention, treatments, and importantly, how we make sure we can make the resources and tools that we have today accessible to everybody here in the United States. Colorectal cancer affects hundreds of thousands of people here, including many of you in this room. For me, it's personal too. My mom is a three-time colorectal cancer survivor. Hi, mom, she's watching, so I had to say hi. <laughs> we can and we must do better when it comes to this disease. And we know that with all of you here with us in person and watching us in the live stream, that together we can make this happen. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Palm, Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, to kick us off today with her opening remarks. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Such a great room to spend a little time uh, together with all of you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I really am pleased uh, to be here um, and really want to recognize uh, the folks you're going to hear from throughout the day. Um, uh, Simone, Craig, others. Uh, I see Jim McRae, who you'll hear from later, uh, who's a, an, an HHS, a member of the HHS family. Uh, really do want to um, express appreciation for the stories. Uh, your personal stories you're going to tell as well as um, uh, the work that you all are going to highlight uh, and discuss today. Um, uh, as Catherine said, uh, cancer really does affect all of us um, and it's really hard to think um, or to find a person where it's not in some way personal to them. Um, uh, so, you know, whether, whether you're young, whether you're young at heart, it really is um, something that brings us all together uh, and really can be a point of unity uh, as we all work together to end cancer as we know it, a challenge that the President and the First Lady have put to us at HHS uh, and that we are working hard to achieve. Um, I'm sure you all have heard um, the recent uh, Cancer Society data um, estimating that in 2023, 153,000 people will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer in the U.S. and uh, uh, and more than, than 52,000 will die from the disease. Um, and we've also learned uh, also recently um, that advanced stage colorectal cancer diagnosis among those under 55 has really increased in the last decade, I think from about 11% to about 20%, which should be startling to all of us as we think about strategies moving forward. Um, and to that end, um, my favorite uh, government acronym, USPSTF, it just feels so good in your mouth. Um, <laughs> the US Preventive Services Task Force uh, lowered the age for screening from uh, 50 to 45, which is, is good news I know to everybody in this room. Um, but when you think about the statistics, uh, that's not enough, right? How we drive people and increase awareness and screening um, as we take advantage of that lower recommendation is really the work uh, that we are focused on at HHS uh, among the large portfolio of, of work that we're doing in this space. Um, because we really understand and appreciate that uh, it's not just age groups and um, demographics and numbers, that these are real folks who are, who are fighting to reach the next milestone for themselves or for someone else, a, a wedding, a graduation, a birthday. Um, we really all are striving uh, 
to extend quality of life and, and reduce illness as, as much as we can in this space. Um, but we also know uh, beyond just um, uh, sort of the, the, the straight facts of the disease that, that uh, ethnic and uh, disparities really do still exist in this space and in others, um, and that we need to do the work of equity um, on the front end of our, of our cancer work as well. Um, so I think as we think about um, the rates of this disease among ethnic minorities, African American men compared to whites, Native Alas um, Alaska Natives and American Indians, all are suffering higher incidence than, than their white counterparts. And so how we do our work in a culturally competent and sensitive way uh, is also critically important to how we reduce uh, death and um, uh, increase quality of life for all Americans. So again, as we think about the call and the challenge that the President and the First Lady have put before us to reduce the cancer deaths by 50% in the next 25 years, we really think about this across the spectrum, right? As a member of the HHS family, I have the real privilege of, of being in an enterprise uh, that, that sort of does it from soup to nuts, right? We have the CDC, we have NIH, we have CMS, we have HRSA, we have SAMHSA, we have a whole host of agencies that come at this problem uh, from, from various um, seats with various um, strengths and uh, capacities and funding streams and how we put that all together in a, a cohesive and comprehensive strategy uh, to do this work is really important and is a, a personal privilege for me to be a part of. And, and one of the ways we really are trying to tackle this um, is to boost our screening and prevention efforts. We, we think that that is a critical part of this work. And, and one of the things we really know um, from the pandemic is, is that people stopped doing the work of uh, prevention, that we, we, we didn't go to the dentist, we didn't go to the doctor, we, we didn't get the preventive screenings that we should have to the tune of about nine and a half million cancer screenings that uh, people did not get uh, during those years of the pandemic. And so we launched a year of, of prevention and screening at HHS where we are working uh, to claw back those nine and a half screenings uh, that were missed. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. Uh, CDC has launched uh, an initiative um, under its Screen for Life National Colorectal Cancer Action Campaign, which does things like, and again, makes, this makes me feel aged, but uses influencers in their social media channels to, uh, right, I, like I'm saying words and I'm not even sure what I'm saying, but you get, you get the drift. Um, and, and so, as we raise awareness about screenings, we also um, really need uh, to make sure we have access. And again, that we're thinking about this from an equity perspective. And our friends at HRSA, um, again, you'll hear from Jim later on in the program, uh, recently awarded nearly $11 million to 22 of our federally qualified health centers to do the work of improving access to screenings, um, which, you know, again, uh, really focuses on underserved communities and, and, and our work to make sure we're doing all that we do in, a, in, an, equi in an equitable way. Um, I also, um, and maybe as a point of personal privilege, want to note the, um, the real benefit that the Affordable Care Act has been in the prevention space. And we, as we're approaching yet another anniversary um, of this law, really should acknowledge and lift up what it has meant to prevention. Um, uh, uh, that the Affordable Care Act has really required um, no-cost access to prevention services um, through government programs as well as in the private insurance market. So I think uh, another opportunity on March 23rd for us to lift up prevention um, and drive a message of uh, encouraging Americans to use the health insurance that they have to access these benefits for, for free. Um, and I also know that many of you really fought for that provision, you helped draft it, you helped make sure it was included, and you drove us at HHS to get it out the door and into effect as soon as possible. So I really appreciate your partnership in that space as well. Um, I, I want to highlight one other area in which we um, are really working to, to understand um, in culturally competent ways access to screening and prevention, and that is a pilot project we've done through the Indian Health Service. Uh, where we, uh, in four sites across the country, um, used uh, Indian Health Service staff 
uh, uh, to connect um, individuals to screening kits, um, to go through the instructions with them, to help do follow-up calls and contacts to make sure people completed those screenings and sent them back. Um, and what we found uh, in three of our four sites was an increased uptake in, in, in the use of these screening tools. And we will take the learnings from our site that did not see an increase in screening and push them forward into additional pilot sites around the country through the Indian Health Service. So again, we, are, we see ourselves as a laboratory for our ways to increase access to screening to increase its use, uh, and then to take those learnings and, and, and build on them um, more broadly. But at, at the end of the day, right, this is, again, not about the numbers and not about the stats, but it really is about putting uh, the people that we serve at the center of everything we do at HHS. Um, and, and while we have made progress and we are very focused on it, uh, within the four walls of my enterprise, there really is so much more to do. Uh, and uh, I just, again, want to express my appreciation for the ongoing partnership we've had with many of you. Would look forward to oppor other opportunities for us to work together to do more uh, important work in this space um, and uh, um, feel really accountable um, uh, to the goal that the President has set for all of us um, and a real uh, privilege and responsibility to be a part of achieving it. So uh, much appreciation to all of you. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Catherine or to Danielle or to Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Palm. Um, and just a word about HHS. Many of, of you asked the question, how do you execute uh, the Cancer Moonshot being so, so, having such a broad and deep portfolio. And when the President reignited the Cancer Moonshot a year ago, he did so with the intent that this would be a all-of-government effort and convened for the first time a cancer cabinet, of course, which HHS is a part of and, as you heard, has done such incredible work for uh, the cancer community as a whole, and, and we thank you for everything. For our next speaker, many of you are already familiar with him. Craig Melvin is a broadcast journalist and NBC News anchor. What you might not know is that Craig, like many of us here in this room and watching, has been personally affected by this disease and has really carried the mantle forward when it comes to creating awareness and education around colorectal cancer. We are incredibly honored that Craig will be providing his recorded remarks here with us today. If you could all turn your attention to the screen. Uh, hello there. Uh, greetings. You look great in the White House. Uh, Craig Melvin here from the Today Show and NBC News. And I, uh, I so uh, very much wanted to be there with you uh, today, uh, but and perhaps you can tell, I am uh, a little under the weather and have been for a couple of days now, but I'm on the mend. Um, in fact, this is the first time I've actually worn a real shirt all week. Um, I digress. I, I, I wanted to just pop in for a moment. And first of all, thank you so much for, for being here being in the room, uh, working uh, on solutions uh, to this terrible, terrible disease um, that has affected all of us in, in some way. Uh, for me, it was my brother Lawrence, Lawrence Meadows. Uh, he was diagnosed in 2016, and he was diagnosed at stage four. And uh, I remember the phone call, he said, um, can you, can you get me some help finding a doctor? I need a second opinion. I said, for what? He said, I oh, this doctor says that they found a, a tumor in my abdomen. And my brother, had, he'd, he'd been losing weight. Um, there had been some blood in his stool and him being a, a man in his 30s, uh, he thought he was gonna be just fine. Thought it was stress. Went to the doctor, doctor told him it was uh, probably a dietary issue, add some fiber. Then he went back to the doctor um, and the doctor wasn't dismissive, but 
And finally, on the third time he went to the doctor, the doctor said, you know what? Let's just run a CT scan and see what we find, just so we can rule, rule that out. And lo and behold, that's when they found um, the tangerine-sized tumor. And by that point, it had already metastasized. It was in some, um, some other parts of, of his body. So at that point, my brother being who he is and uh, me insisting that that was going to be a chapter in his, his life, not his story. We got that second opinion, went out to MD Anderson and found an angel of a doctor named Scott Kopetz who was very honest about his prognosis <clears throat> and uh, his course of treatment. And um, the, I remember that first meeting with Dr. Kopetz. He all but said, I can probably buy you a couple years. And he did. He did. My, my brother uh, fought valiantly. And uh, we lost him in December of 2020. It's hard to believe because it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Um, what I did not know until the very end is when it became apparent to Lawrence that um, he, was, he was not going to win his battle, he decided, and he, he told Dr. Kopetz and the team at MD Anderson that he wanted his body uh, to be used to search for treatments, a cure. And he spent the last year or so as a guinea pig of sorts um, opening, himself, opening himself up to treatments that he knew were not going to work because he thought it might help someone down the line. After his death, my family and I um, pledged to get involved and help find a cure, help find better treatments. And so I joined the board of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Um, and the organization, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's based in D.C. It is um, the gold standard when it comes to nonprofits who help people who have been afflicted with this terrible disease, connecting patients with, with doctors uh, and resources, um, funding research, being advocates. Uh, so some of the proudest work that I've done over the past few years has been on behalf of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance and with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. And I think Michael Sapiens is in the room there. At least I hope he is. Um, and it, it's, it, it, you know, as all of you know, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that, that we have a huge problem with in our society, in our country, no one likes to talk about their colons. No one likes to talk about their rectums. No one likes to talk about their stool, much less blood in their stool. So I've, I've tried to use the Today Show and the platform at NBC News to help demystify and destigmatize a colorectal cancer, raising awareness. And I think we've done a fair amount of that over the past few years. Um, I pledge to continue to do more. Uh, and I hope all of you uh, will continue to do more as well. Thank you so much again for being here. And uh, hopefully next year, next time we do this, I can be right there with you at the White House. Um, I would discourage all of you from stealing anything uh, from 1600 Pennsylvania. They frown upon that. Unless it's, never mind, I won't make that joke here. Good day, have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Craig. And if you're watching, get well. And maybe we can send you some White House chocolates to make up for it. I'm not sure, but you know, something. Um, moving on to our next speaker, it is really my distinct honor to welcome to the podium Dr. Danielle Carnival. Danielle serves as the Deputy Assistant to the President for the Cancer Moonshot and as the Deputy Director of Health Outcomes at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I'm like literally running out of breath reading your titles, Danielle. <laughs> Danielle was appointed by the President to lead this charge and lead this charge she has. Danielle will be sharing with us remarks about the Cancer Moonshot goals and the progress we've made, and I just want to take this moment to recognize you and thank you for all the work you've done for this mission. Danielle, over to you.
Thank you, Catherine. Uh, welcome to the White House. Uh, and during budget week, no less, a holiday around here. Uh, but we'll get back to that. I wanted to uh, really talk about why we're here today. Um, and that's because, and we've heard some, some testament to that already, but the precious lives we lose every year to colorectal cancer, more than 50,000. Our sons and daughters, moms and dads, spouses and friends. Despite so much progress, the impact of this disease is felt too strongly for too many Americans. So to today our goal is this, to outline new actions we can take, not just to talk, to outline new actions we can take that, because we must turn the tide to drive colorectal cancer prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivorship for all Americans. I want to start where the President and First Lady so often start, and that's with hope. I don't have to tell this crowd that we don't mean hope in the abstract. We mean hope grounded in science, hope grounded in quality care, hope grounded in keeping families together, hope represented by every survivor in this room and those enabled by um, the work of those in this room. There is so much reason for hope. That's why the President and First Lady reignited the cancer moonshot just over a year ago and set bold new goals to, inc to decrease the death rate from cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years and to improve the experience of people, their families, caregivers, loved ones through living with and surviving cancer. To be clear, this means improving research and innovation to develop new ways to prevent, detect, and treat cancer. But just as much, and, and uh, Deputy Secretary Palm spoke to this, just as much it means making sure we reach all Americans with the tools we already have and those we develop along the way. This is possible because of decades of progress. We all know, but we all know there is so much more work to be done. The President often says he wants to end cancer as we know it. We took that very concretely and said, how do we know cancer today so that we have an understanding of how we measure our progress? Too often we diagnose it too late. We've already heard about that and we'll hear more. We have too few tools or do too little to prevent it. There are stark inequities excuse me, in diagnosis, access to treatments and trials and in outcomes. We know too little about how to target treatments to the right patients. There's cancers for which we lack good strategies, especially the deadliest cancers, rare and childhood cancers. We leave most patients and caregivers to navigate the disease in its aftermath on their own, and we don't learn from the experiences of enough patients. The good news, that sounds really dire, but the good news is that there are, in each of these areas, we can point to a new approach for caring for patients or a new innovation that can be brought to make progress. For example, in the area of supporting patients and caregivers, we can help people overcome the medical, financial, and emotional burdens that cancer brings by providing support to navigate a cancer diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. For example, to address inequities, we can ensure that every community in America, rural, urban, tribal, and everywhere in between, has access to cutting-edge diagnostics, therapeutics, trials, by rethinking our research and care system and expanding its reach. And to speed progress against the most deadly and rare cancers, including childhood cancers, we can invest in a robust pipeline for new science and treatments, and the COVID-19 pandemic response has demonstrated that we can accelerate clinical trials without compromising safety and effectiveness. We present this as a shared agenda. On our side, as Catherine talked about, we formed the first ever cancer cabinet that's driving this whole of government effort to unleash every possible asset within our power, from the Department of Health and Human Services to the Departments of Labor, Veterans Affairs, Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency, and many others. And they set out priority actions. One, to close the screening gap, the one that was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, but that has, been, um, that has ex uh, experienced disparities and inequities uh, even before then. Two, to understand and address environmental and toxic exposures. Three, to decrease the impact of preventable cancers. Four, to bring cutting edge research through the pipeline to patients and communities. And five, to support patients and caregivers. Nearly 30 new announcements were made in just the first year of the cancer moonshot from the Biden-Harris administration as initial steps to target these priority goals. 
Over the past year, the Cancer Moonshot has spurred tremendous action across the federal government and the public and private sectors, laying a foundation for the work ahead. More than 60 private companies, nonprofits, academic institutions, and patient groups have already stepped up. Some of, those are, some of them are in this room. For one, in response to a call to action specifically around cancer screening and early detection, we announced new efforts last May from uh, biopharmaceutical companies, health centers, organizations working in, together in Harlem, Washington, D.C., Ohio, Florida, Appalachia, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama to reach communities with knowledge, support, and access to early cancer detection. We are confident that these new initiatives will get people back to screening, which will save and extend lives. I mention all of this because it provides a model for how to leverage the President's commitment to ending cancer as we know it across all pillars and to provide the Cancer Moonshot as a, mo as a platform to highlight progress across the public and private sectors. But as I said, we're just getting started. In his State of the Union address, pre the President doubled down on the Cancer Moonshot as part of his unity agenda. Issues that can bring us together to deliver for the American people. The President told the story of a young girl who beat incredible odds and today is cancer free. He talked about the hope that she represents to so many Americans. You see, taking on cancer is one of the life missions for the President and the First Lady because of the impact it has had on them. But it is a presidential priority because it impacts every one of us, because it impacts and cuts short too many American lives. In his State of the Union address, President Biden committed to bold new steps to deliver on the Cancer Moonshot mission. This includes bringing America's cancer research system into the 21st century. As we work to continue the progress we've made over the last year, the administration is urging Congress to reauthorize the National Cancer Act, which 52 years ago set up the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, at, in its current form. The reauthorization will update, update the nation's cancer research and care systems to put American modern innovation fully to work and to end cancer as we know it, including clinical trial networks, data systems, and more. Two, providing patient navigation support to every American facing cancer. The Biden-Harris administration will take steps to ensure that patient navigation services, services that help guide individuals, caregivers, and families through cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment, and survivorship are covered benefits going forward for as many people facing cancer as possible. We know the impact that that will have. And three, tackling the singest, singest, single biggest driver of cancer deaths in the country smoking. The administration is preparing further action to help people avoid smoking in the first place and to support Americans who want to quit. And just yesterday, the President released his FY24 budget. The budget de details a fiscally responsible blueprint to build on this progress, to deliver on the agenda the President laid out in the State of the Union and finish the job. The budget will reduce deficits by nearly $3 trillion over 10 years. The President often says, that his dad has an expression. I'm not sure his dad's the only one, but we always listen when the, when the president quotes his parents. He says, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. I'm glad to say that the budget shows the value the president places on the cancer moonshot. It lays out investments including, just at HHS, $1.7 billion focused on key programs related to the cancer moonshot at the National Cancer Institute, the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and the Indian Health Service. This includes a total investment of $7.8 billion for NCI, plus expected critical contributions from $2.5 billion for ARPA-H to help deliver on moonshot goals. Nearly of importance here, nearly $400 million of that is for CDC programs including additional investments for the colorectal cancer program, control program to increase colorectal cancer screening rates among people aged 45 to 75. But as I said, but this will take all of us. And that's where, as the, pres the president called on everyone to do their part, that's what we're focused on today. He called on the scientific community to bring its boldest thinking to the fight, the medical and public health community to improve their outreach to and support for underserved communities, to help patients and families have the best possible experience. He called on the private sector to step up, to develop and test new treatments, to share more data and knowledge, 
and to collaborate on tools that will benefit all Americans. And respectfully, he called on people living with cancer and survivors, their caregivers and families, and those who have lost someone to keep sharing their perspectives and experiences and to keep pushing for progress. So for everyone in this room and beyond, please visit whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. Share your video stories, send your ideas, contribute new actions and collaborations. The Cancer Moonshot is a platform uh, to highlight progress aligned with these goals. So today, it's on us to start to drive forward that action. I look forward to the rest of the program. And to start, as I said, the goals we have, and, and uh, Deputy Secretary Palm talked about this as well, they only matter because the numbers, the goals, the mission represent people, represent human lives. And so to hear another story of personal experience, I want to turn the podium over to Simone Ledward Bozeman, uh, who is a singer and artist um, and uh, a colorectal cancer caregiver who has really taken the fight as part of the Fight Colorectal Cancer um, Organization, or Fight CRC, um, and joined so many of you in becoming an advocate and a voice against this disease. So Simone, please. Okay, everybody just take a deep breath. It's gonna be fine. There's no reason to be nervous. Um, hi. Um, hello. Uh, I would like to send a, a thank you to President Biden, First Lady Jill Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris and the Cancer Moonshot team, to Dr. Fola May, Angie Davis, and the Fight Colorectal Cancer team. It's really, it's really an honor to be here today to speak with you all. Um, my name is Simone, born to Cheryl and Lyle in the small-ish city of Vallejo, California, the baby of the family, so you know a little bit about me, which means when nobody's talking to each other, they're all still talking to this one right here. My parents are hardworking and practical. They said, go to college, get a job with benefits and a 401k, maybe work for the state. I did at least end up going to college, a state school, and I majored in a major that didn't make no money, um, but somehow I wound up with a job at the prestigious Hollywood Bowl. And on the concert schedule at work was a tribute to the legendary performer James Brown. Talk around the office was centered on this actor, the star of a biopic on Mr. Brown that was released around the same time. He was considering an offer to be a special guest on our show. To my bosses, he was a big deal and I was eager to impress, but I had no idea how important he would be to me. How his life would alter the course of mine. Of course, he did confirm and he was a guest on our show and of course, we met um, and of course, he was charming and kind and wonderful. And of course there was courtship, and of course we fell in love because he was someone so easy to love. His name was Chad, if you were fortunate enough to know him. And Chadwick, if you only knew him from afar. But even from afar you could tell that he was incredible and brilliant, he was so smart. He was uplifting and inspiring and, and supportive. He was wise, he was, he was loyal, and he loved with intention and permanence. And with respect and love to my hardworking, practical parents, it was Chad who really taught me how to dream. He taught me about faith, and he moved with a power and, and, and a graciousness and a humility that said, my strength is not my own. My parents loved him. My sister loved him, and she really doesn't like anybody. <laughs> my nephew would call me almost daily and say, hi, Tia, where Uncle Chad? Like, I am nobody. Like, I'm just here answering the phones. And then, on top of all of that, he was a movie star like an actual 
global phenomenon, which to anyone sounds beautiful and glamorous and fun, and it was. And we went to the movie premieres and the after parties and we drank Beyonce champagne. And we sat front row at the Oscars and courtside at the All-Star Game. And we did this while nobody knew that we left the interview to go to chemo. That we left chemo to get on a plane and do a press tour. That we left the award show and watched the ending from a hospital bed, terrified that our private life would become a topic of public chatter from a bad paparazzi photo, watching online as people insisted that his weight loss was for a role or in, insinuated he was on drugs. And the juxtaposition of these moments was absolutely mind-blowing to be so young and in love and, and on top of the world, holding on for dear life, holding on to faith and holding it all in confidence. Um, I was 26 and completely unprepared for what all of that would mean. Um, and he was 39. 11 years away from what at the time would have been his first regular colon cancer screening. He had been to the doctor a few times before he told me. And if anybody in this room, which I'm sure you do, knows how much it takes to get a man to go to the doctor, that was a lot. That was a lot. 11 years away. What would now still be six years away from his first colon cancer screening. And everybody here knows the rest of that story, six years, was too late. And I think that possibly the foremost heartbreaking fact is that it didn't have to be too late if we had known. Possibly the second most heartbreaking fact is that ours was not an anomaly. It was not an isolated incident. It was happening before it happened to us. If we had known. If we had known how hard his demographic was being hit by this disease, if we had known that among young black adults, the proportion of rectal cancers being diagnosed at late stages rose from basically none to 46% between 2000 and 2016. And Chad was diagnosed in 2016, as was Craig Melvin's brother, as we heard earlier. If we had known. If we had known that black men and women are over 20% more likely to be diagnosed with this disease and at later stages, if we had known that black people have the highest rates of colon cancer among any ethnic group in the whole of this country, that we tend to get it younger and have lower survival rates, if we'd known what symptoms to look for, if we had known how preventable and treatable this disease really is if we had known that a $25 fit test taken in his late 20s or early 30s could have detected this cancer and saved his life. Surely if we had known, but we didn't. And so many people in black communities still don't. So many people have no idea. They are, at no fault of their own, vastly underestimating their risk of developing and dying from this disease. Dying roughly 40% more than any of their counterparts in any other racial or ethnic group. And research tells us that this is not about a biological difference. This is about access, and this is about information. Having information about this disease and its preventative measures will save people's lives. There is no question about it. And funding for research that helps us understand why 20 and 30 year olds are dying from a disease they shouldn't even have to think about for another 20 or 30 years. Research that helps us understand how to best disseminate this information and information about screenings, methods of approach to screenings that are both suitable 
and accessible to the groups that are being the most affected, to the communities most affected by this disease. Funding for research that helps us develop better early detection tools and helps us truly democratize those tools. We can't keep approaching this disease from the perspective of doing what works for everybody else. Clearly, it is not working. And in order for our healthcare system to stand up against the beliefs and values of this great democracy, we need to first acknowledge these disparities and we need a new angle. We need a new approach. Now, this is not, this is not a single layer issue. It runs all the way down to the root and I know that that feels very daunting but I am here in hopes that we won't be afraid of that challenge. I'm here to truly urge the White House, to urge every single person in this room to continue shedding light on this disease, to pay attention to the information that you're going to receive today on behalf of the over 27,000 people under the age of 50, that are expected to be diagnosed with this disease in, in the next seven years. By 2030, colorectal cancer is expected to be the leading cause of cancer deaths in people ages 20 to 49. 20 to 49. There are 44 million people eligible for colon cancer screenings in this country today. So I am asking that you please not let today be the only day we have this conversation. Thank you. Simone, thank you for those powerful and beautiful words, for your strength and your advocacy in this space. This is not an easy task, but I do have to pivot from that story to the rest of our program, which is also where all the work within the community is being done. Today, we know that colorectal cancer, as Simone mentioned, is preventable through regular colorectal cancer screenings and modifiable behaviors. Getting that screening message out and making screening actionable and accessible is where we see challenges, but also the most promise. And so I'm pleased to welcome Brooks and our first panel on colorectal screening and prevention. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. No, I just, I, I'll Hey everyone. Hi. So let's um, do some quick intros. Um, Michael, why don't you start and we'll go this way. Test, test. Hello everybody, Michael Sapienza. I'm the CEO of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Very happy to be here. I'm Karen Knudsen. I'm the CEO of the American Cancer Society, Cancer Society and ACS CAN. I'm Lisa Richardson. I'm here from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hi, I'm Angie Davis. I'm the president of Fight Colorectal Cancer. Great, thanks everyone. So I'm Brooks Bell, and I am thrilled to be here today. I call myself a colonoscopy enthusiast, and I'm an early onset colon cancer survivor. I was diagnosed about four years ago, and thankfully I'm fine today. Um, and I'm also on the CDC Foundation Board, and I've actually done some work with two of the panelists. Um, I've, through supporting Lisa's work at the CDC, and um, founding Lead From Behind, a project uh, and, uh, that's part of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance um, that I'm proud to say lifted uh, colonoscopy appointments by 36% after we launched it. Uh, but my passion is really all about colonoscopies, persuading people to get a colonoscopy because it's pretty much the only screening that prevents colon cancer. And going through the, my colon cancer journey 
I learned that that's something that I didn't know before I was diagnosed, and it's something that very few people know. And so that is my mission, is to educate people on the power of colonoscopies, destigmatize colonoscopies, and to inspire a million colonoscopies in the next decade. So I am so honored to be here today, and thank you to the Cancer Moonshot, to the president, to everyone who put this amazing meeting on today. So thank you to you guys for being here. I think we're gonna have a great conversation. And we are in front of this incredible audience. Um, we've got uh, the experts in pretty much every part of the screening continuum. Uh, we have people on the live stream listening in. And we, have, we even have um, patients who are starting their cancer journey. And so since we have such, and we only have 40 minutes, I wish we could do it for like four hours. But um, I wanted, you guys are each part of an impressive organization, leading impressive organizations doing critical work in this space. And I just wanted to give you each sort of an open moment to speak for a few minutes on what is like the one message that you wanted to make sure you had time to deliver today. Um, like it could be an accomplishment, it could be an insight, it could be, an ask, it could be something that we think that we could, we could be doing as a community. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Michael again. Thank you, Brooks. First, I just want to say to Simone, thank you very much for telling this story. And I really think that if over the next five to 10 years, we can make this difference um, in all this health inequity, we will have won, right? Like we will have made a huge difference. So I just want to say on behalf of somebody who lost their mom to this disease, I appreciate Candace, all the work that you've done, all the work that all these organizations have done. Um, so Brooks brought up the colonoscopy enthusiast and um, you know, we've been working a lot together. Uh, and I would just say, number one, the biggest message that we probably can get across is that colon cancer is the preventable cancer. But unlike Brooks, I think that every single screening modality is something that is gonna help save people's lives, no matter what it is, because not everybody has the same access, right, to all these life-saving screenings. So the Colorectal Cancer Alliance has been spending a lot of time on end-to-end -end navigation. So really actually doing marketing to different communities, so starting with the amazing idea that Brooks brought to us with Leave From Behind with Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, and we'll be doing this again with a quote unquote, A-list celebrity, but person of color to bring that high level attention that we need. We were lucky to see that 34% increase in, in colonoscopy scheduled for the month after. But then how do we get into the community? How do we make sure like Candace is doing in Chicago and others are doing across the country, like Dr. Isaka is doing um, in Washington State, how do we make sure we get into those communities and are able to navigate every single patient? And that's what the Alliance is doing. We're doing that with Matthew McCurdy over here with Black Health and others in figuring out really, okay, so from the beginning, getting someone to know, just like you were saying, Simone, they need to know about this and then getting them to actually act. Right, so we have a, a screening quiz called uh, getscreen.org that we've had now hundreds of thousands of people go through. And then, now we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we then get them to actually schedule that screening, make sure that it happens, and then of course have the navigation in terms of treatment, et cetera. So again, I would just say the biggest piece, I think, is this is the preventable cancer, and that messaging and that tiered approach and end-to-end -end navigation is something that is incredibly important. Thanks, Michael. Karen, you're up. Sure, agree with everything that was said. And I think there are just two really important things to know about current trends with colorectal cancer. And this is something that the American Cancer Society commits to the nation. It's one of our major research endeavors every year, is to look at all 200 cancers and understand what's going in the right direction, where we need to double down, and where we need to think differently. And certainly colorectal cancer is where we need to think differently. We talked a lot already about early onset, which is really important. One in five cancer diagnoses for colorectal cancer this year will be in someone under age 50. So there's something fundamental about that. It's, it's access to care, but certainly more research needs to get done to understand this shift. But it's also the case, and this is the second alarm that we haven't heard about, which is that three in five diagnoses right now are with advanced stage disease. So this might be a preventable cancer, 
It might be a screenable cancer, but we got a long way to go to make sure that we actually find it at earlier stages. So, you know, what to do, I'm very thankful for the 190 partners that we work with at the American Cancer Society's Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. I think a lot of the partners are here in this room, and that's where we all lean in. So if there's someone who's not part of that roundtable that wants to be, please let us know. If there's someone who wants to join us in research, please let us know. Uh, you know, right now we have 64 uh, different grants funded across the country. It's $61 million specific to colorectal cancer, but it's across the board. It's the things you heard about today. What's the biology of disease that could be changing? What is the genetics of risk? But also, what is an implementation strategy for colorectal cancer screening? And how can we refine that across the country? We put that to work in our patient support pillar, working in 5,000 communities across the country. We, our organizational goals at the American Cancer Society include our ability to enhance uptake of screening with health systems that we work with. But then finally, I also invite anyone who'd like to work with us through advocacy. So that ACS CAN component is our 501c4. We can and do affect change, including at the federal level, um, for ensuring that there is complete reimbursement for colonoscopy for someone who's tested positive with an at-home test. That's net new as of this year. Also ensuring that there is complete reimbursement for someone who has a screening colonoscopy that finds a polyp previously shifted to a, uh, you know, a, a diagnostic screening for which there was a copay, and many partners helped us affect change for that. We talked about this even at the White House when the moonshot launched. So end story, we got a lot to do. Early onset, advanced stage disease. Colonoscopy is both prevention and screening is the message that we've got to get across, but getting screened has to be the first start for everyone. So I want to um, thank the um, um, organizers for having me, and I want to start with more of a, you know, which one of the thousand cards could I pull from the deck to talk about how great the CDC is. I mean, I could pull a 500 of them. <laughs> but I think what I heard um, from our, speak our last speaker was how do we make sure that everybody knows what they should be getting? How do we empower them to ask for those things that they need? I'm sure Chad went to the doctor several times. It wasn't picked up because he was so young. Um, when I think about the work we do at the CDC, and especially our colorectal cancer control program, it really is one person at a time. I mean, when we look at this, what is it, 13 per 100,000, whatever that number is, this one individual person at a time. And several people have said this today. This is a disease of individuals, not of groups of people. And at CDC, we try to take the individual approach to the problem, as well as the larger issue of health systems. I see Dr. Dominance here, and he participated in a um, male fit summit that we had, and we developed a, um, workbook basically, I hate that word toolkits, uh, but workbook and the VA, you know, he's graciously going to, you know, present that and hopefully have that all the VAs in the, in the country, which is a lot of people who need to be screened for colon cancer. Um, and secondarily, I'll say one of the biggest things that we have to do, and we talked about this earlier, mm -hmm. is um, what, what gets measured gets done, basically. If we don't measure it, it doesn't get done. And I think, you know, the VA, I loved, I loved working at the VA when I was there. I trained there and I worked there afterwards. But the VA has some of the best metrics in the country. I'm speaking for the VA now. Thank you. Ah, exactly. Um, but, I mean, when you go there, you know what happened. Those, and there are many physicians here who work there at the VA. And so we try to pattern ourselves after that, that we have to have data to make the case to the president, to Congress, to whoever, that these things actually do work and we need to do more and make sure it's available to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We love the CDC, you do a good job. Um, no, this is such a, an amazing group of people in this room. Fight Colorectal Cancer is an advocacy organization really fighting for access to care and treatment for colorectal cancer patients. Um, and really a compliment to the groups here on this panel. Um, I feel like as an organization to empower our survivors, our caregivers, um, stories like Simone, we don't want to hear any more stories like Simone's, um, we have to be a squeaky wheel. And we have to respond to the call to action that the president has put in front of us. And as Danielle so articulately outlined, the moonshot is a dream we have to strive for. 
and we cannot be afraid to tackle the second leading cause of cancer deaths in our country and hold our leaders accountable to investing in this cancer because we have to be able to provide access to care for all. And to do that, we have to leverage the power of this room. And I wish those who are watching could see the individual leaders and champions in this room because that's what's going to make a change in our country. Um, so we have over 200 survivors and caregivers coming this week to talk to their members of Congress. I encourage everyone to remind their members of Congress um, that they need to invest time and effort into colorectal cancer. And we'll have 27,000 flags on the National Mall to remember that we do not want colorectal cancer to be the leading cause of cancer deaths for individuals between 20 and 45. And we have an obligation to do something about it. So I am so proud to be in this room and to be able to be a part of this panel to fight for patients and for all the kids who have lost their parents to colorectal cancer. Thanks, Angie. Um, that was, thank you all, that was great. So to kind of key off of a, a word you just said, invest. If I want to have a kind of a theoretical question, I'm going to ask you, Angie, first. Because I think, I, I don't think Lisa can actually. Get all she's charged all, up over she's here. She's not allowed. <laughs> Spend some money. She's not, yes. So let's say someone very powerful gave you a billion dollars. Mm. What, do you, what do you think it should be spent on? Would it like research? Could it be just buying colonoscopies for everybody? So if there is a billionaire watching right mm -hmm. now <laughs> and you need my phone number, um, I'm happy to share it. But no, I think that there's, you know, Simone eloquently said this, it's a multi-layered issue. We have a lot of work to do, but I would love to see the CDC funded um, in every state to provide colorectal cancer screening. I would love to see NCI's investment in colore colorectal cancer research and access to clinical trials. I think there are real challenges that we have as it relates to being able to aggregate data. Um, we just had a conversation about how can we measure what we're doing and how can we measure quality of care but we have to know this and we have to invest in it. And I do think it's not just one investment, it's a long-term investment. And just sort of, as we talk about health equity, I wanna just sort of underscore, this cannot be a buzzword. Mm -hmm. I hope that it isn't. Because we need a long-term investment in access to care. Mm -hmm. So I hope we can take that billion dollars and invest it every year in colorectal cancer. Thanks. So Lisa, um, so talking about health equity mm -hmm. and the work that the CDC has been doing when creating, supporting so many programs across the state and giving them best practices, you've been sort of front line seeing kind of what works and what doesn't work. What are, what are some of the things that interesting, just tactical things you've learned about, about reaching unscreened people that have been difficult to get to? So I think one of the, and there are many people in the room here who've done some of this research as well, I think the most tactical thing I can think of is going into the community to learn what people need. What's the language they speak? What are the words that are most important to people? If we're going to educate, one of the things that I've noticed that we want to, what, what's the saying, we want to go to the, we want to go where the people are. But do, really, do you really want to go where the people are? You understand what I mean. Because if you really want to go where they are, you will go and you will listen and you will bring back the solutions that they know the solutions. But we have to get off of our ivory tower government, academia, whatever tower you're living in, and just go talk to the people and ask them what they need. Because they know what they need. As all of us in physicians in the audience know, if you ask, they'll tell you. They'll probably tell you more than you want to know. But, um, but really, I think that's where we come in at CDC, is that all of our programs are on the ground, um, in the clinics. For instance, if we, even if we work with a health system, we implement our program in each individual clinic. And I think that really is the way that we're going to reach people where they are, ask them what they need, and then provide what they need. This gets at something that Michael and Brooks said before. You know, there's great research out there that shows if you only offer a fit test, if you only offer a colonoscopy, people will walk away because they want choice. They want to do the thing that they feel is best for them and what they need to do. So in our programs, that's what we do. 
Um, one of our successes actually during the pandemic as we were, my people are all over this thing, so I found out about this when I was reviewing the paper, but you know, how did, how did clinics modify what they do during the COVID pandemic for colon cancer and our colon cancer program? What they did was they doubled down on things that we know that work, evidence-based interventions from the community guide. And so, and those clinics were able to maintain their screening at the same level, believe it or not, People were getting care out there, you know, in different places in the country at the same level before the, you know, COVID hit. So there's a lot of stories out there, a lot of successes, and we've written a ton about, you know, all the successes we had in our last go around in the program. So I recommend that to you. But for us, it really is just going where the people are and learning what they need. I love that when the, um, you mentioned having just weekend hours. Yeah. And just having things in other languages, like simple, right. simple so, basics right. are, really powerful. Yeah, there's a great program in Kentucky where they have the um, colonoscopy clinic on the weekends on Saturdays. They have it one Saturday where they just do colonoscopies on Saturdays. There's some people who cannot get off work because they hourly workers, you know, lots of people in my family still do that. You know, they go at eight, they clock in, they clock out at five. They can't make it to your office or your colonoscopy facility. Um, some work we've done in um, sick leave um, if you don't have sick leave, you can't get off work. And a study just came out recently, like in the last couple months, that when people have sick leave, they're more likely to get screened for cancer. Mm -hmm. Can't remember where I saw that. I read, well, I read a lot of stuff, but, but, it, but that, that struck me as, okay, all they need is an afternoon off to go get a colonoscopy. So you know, we need to try to accommodate what people need. Um, so Karen, you recently, or ACS just recently published uh, some the, the new data about 20% 20, 20 of cases will be from people under the age of 55. And of course, we just reduced the screening age down to 45, and I'm sure that's gonna cost so much money to screen people at a lower age, which is amazing that we're already investing in that way. What do you, but it's continuing to get lower and lower. I was diagnosed at 38, and clearly 45 for a lot of people is still not young enough. What are what are the thoughts about whether or not it's possible like to one day lower it further or to think about other other how do we tackle the young onset yeah definitely want to answer that but for just a second i want to take off my hat as acs and i want to be a former head of oncology for a 16 hospital system what was just discussed about changing the way you do business for screening can work miracles, I can tell you that. What happens when you open up screening colorectal or breast cancer on the weekends or early in the morning if possible or late at night, unbelievable. So just something for us to think about as we work across the country. All right, screening guidelines. So, you know, it's important to remember, so we were actually the first to reduce the screening guideline to 45 and then the government followed a couple years later. Um, so we continue to look at those evidence, um, the, the evidence for guideline change. But what's really important is that 45 is for individuals of average risk. That is not for everyone. And what I think needs to come as part of the messaging as we're working with communities, couldn't agree more, is to understand that your cancer screening plan should consist of your age, your family history, your personal history, your genetic risk if you know it, the genetic risk of your family if you know it. And all of that should constitute a really good discussion with your primary care physician at the time of adulthood about what your screening plan should be for you based on what you know. So in order to do that, you need to bring in a different stakeholder, and that's the primary care physician. So using things like Project ECHO, which you know, many of us have, have used and the, and the roundtable helps to support, we can educate primary care physicians across the country. It's an important key step for us. Would, should the guideline be changed? This is something we evaluate every time there is a trend that's going in the wrong direction, something we'll continue to assess. But you know, the other key component that we haven't talked about here, which I think is as important as screening, is prevention. Because the data tell us right now that 55% of colorectal cancers could be potentially prevented through modifiable behaviors. And so that message needs to coincide with the screening and prevention and what is my own personal risk message if we're truly going to you know, make this goal of significantly reducing mortality from colorectal cancer. What do you think is one of the modifiable behaviors that is like the 
one of the top two or three. Yeah, so one of the things that we're watching as tobacco-related cancers start to decline, thankfully, you know, great job, everyone, um, is that unfortunately the cancers associated with lack of physical um, activity and with a higher uh, uh, body weight are unfortunately on the rise, and colorectal cancer is one of them. So, you know, we know that there are things to avoid, sedentary lifestyles, avoid, you know, an unhealthy diet, which would consist of red meat, processed foods, um, alcohol, excessive alcohol, uh, and also, you know, diets that are low in good things, calcium, vegetables, fruits, fibers. Not so easy for everyone to achieve. We all know we should be healthy. We all know we should eat healthier. But research is actually important here. What works? What works in different communities? What works in different neighborhoods? What works in different age groups? for instilling healthier lifestyles is an important research question. Research is not just how do we treat somebody who already has cancer. Thanks. So Michael, you have made big investments in ramping up your screening and prevention programs over the last couple of years. Um, what was the kind of your strategy in, in that and why are you investing in screening and prevention? Brooks, before I go there, can I just say one thing about Young Onset, if, if I can, mm -hmm. which is about the research side of it. You know, I'm staring at a lot of oncologists in this room. And my opinion, and I think the opinion of a lot of others, is we still need to figure out why this increase is happening, right? And I do think that that's a research question, right? And so the more we can invest in that, the better, because we do need to know. It is not gonna, we are not gonna be able to lower the screen age to 35 mm -hmm. by you know, next year, et cetera. So, Nor do we know that we should. Correct, exactly, right? So yes, we want patients to be their own advocates, we want them to make sure that if they have blood in their stool, et cetera, that they're going to, the, going to their doctor, but we also need to know why. So I just, I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. I, I, I said that. Um, and then one other thing I was just listening to when we were talking about family history, I was having a conversation this morning with one of the screening leaders in the country, and he's saying, as part of electronic health records, they actually don't track family history. Now, that is, at, least, at least broadly they don't. I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous. And so if that's something we can work on together as well, I mean, that, that would make a huge difference. In terms of strategy around prevention, number one, Brooks knows this well, because she helped found Lead From Behind, right? We've got to get people talking about colorectal cancer. Right? Until recently, there have not been A-list people talking about this disease, which you know, made it so people necessarily wouldn't talk about it at their dinner table, et cetera. So leave from behind, that's the whole idea. Get celebrity involved, make sure that we potentially are uh, the, the alliance utilizing our health equity fund, you know, looking at consumer brands to raise money so we can actually make a difference in those communities because you know, we talk about this long-term investment. Angie, I couldn't agree more in this long-term investment in terms of equity, right? Whether we're talking about African-Americans, rural Americans, et cetera. But the question is, is how how do we have enough money in the entire system, whether it's an advocacy organization, whether it's the CDC, whether it's ACS, et cetera, to keep doing that, right? Because yes, we can have scalable and fundable, et cetera, programs, but we still need significant investment like we've seen in breast cancer, et cetera. So that's one of the reasons why Lead From Behind was created. And then we have also done what we call um, local campaigns, mainly targeted at the African-American community, using African-American influencers. They didn't say is what we called it to really reach those individuals. And the other thing that we've been doing a lot of in a lot of our pilots in underserved communities is actually looking at gift cards and sweepstakes. And it has worked like you cannot believe. In terms of like when before we did that, it was something like, you know, our click through rate was maybe 2% and after it was like 15 to 20%. And then even completion of our quiz and actually getting to screen, we saw just a huge, huge jump. So, you know, I, I mean, I think our concentration in screening is yes, we've got to think about the African American community, we have to think about the Hispanic community, and we have to make sure, as you said, Lisa, that we are creating these programs to be able to be sustainable scalable, equitable, et cetera. I was gonna to add to that. So I think that the awareness that the Colon Cancer Alliance is doing is, is exceptional. But I also want to underscore that advocacy locally is so important. So having an authentic relationship with the communities that you're reaching out to is so important. And that 
you know, our role is to amplify, to be a catalyst, to support those efforts. Um, and so when we talk about colorectal cancer, we talk about stigma, and we talk about risk, I think it's so important that if you're watching, if you're a survivor, you have a family history of colorectal cancer, that we are talking about it. Because I do think that broad awareness campaigns are wonderful, but it's the person standing in front of you saying, I really wish I didn't have to go to chemo if I had gotten screened, and that you have a family history of it, and I'm gonna make sure you go get screened. That's the person who's really navigating that person to care and making it actionable. So not to underestimate the power of those local champions and leaders who need to be talking about colorectal cancer. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's right, it's like, you know, nation of allies or whatever we call them, you know, relentless champions. The more our organizations can work work together to build a community. Because again, if you look at breast cancer, you look at leukemia and lymphoma, you look at HIV AIDS, you look at the heart disease, they have created a massive community that brings people together to do exactly what you're saying. So I'll put a period on that sentence. <laughs> the, um, so what we did, one of the studies that we did, seriously, is we asked the question for, it was a breast cancer project, who do you want to see delivering messages about this problem. And they said, I want to see someone who looks like my grandmother, mm -hmm. not Oprah. But they specifically said that, not me. But it was one of those things. But people want to see real people, to Angie's point, who've had this problem or who know someone who's had this problem, right? And so it's really, that was like the most amazing thing I ever heard. We always think that people need different things. People want the same things. You just have to put the correct wrapper on it so that you reach that community. And towards building solutions, if I may, there's another constituency here that we haven't really heard about that I want to make sure everybody is aware of. So, you know, we talked about the NCI, the National Cancer Act today. There are 71 National Cancer Institute Cancer Centers of Excellence across the country. Every single one of them has a community advisory board that is intended, is required, intended to have bilateral communication with their communities. They understand their catchment area, they're in their catchment area, uh, you know, we're there too, but, but every cancer center is really committed to doing the right thing, including screening, for the cancer patients and families in their in their area. So, you know, for those of you who have not yet reached out in your community to work with your major cancer center, you probably can and should. Um, they have all of the data. They know where they're the screening deserts in the region. Um, right now, um, all of the diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders from these major cancer centers are in San Diego with my chief diversity, diversity officer, and they're having this discussion right now about actionable items for, for all cancers. So I think we're almost out of time. So what, so let's see, what, are, what have we decided to do? <laughs> so we're, we're gonna work together, work together as organizations, have consistent messaging. We're gonna consult communities about what they need. Bilateral communication right. with communities, right? Okay. Sustainable funding and reaching people on the ground. Access to care advocacy. Remind Danielle when we get that money for the moonshot that it needs to go to colorectal cancer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. You think, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we can all agree that that was uh, an incredible panel with incredible panelists. Um, and especially grateful for the panel calling out the importance of equitable access uh, and health equity, especially. And also, Lisa, the words, if you don't measure it, we won't get it done, are now forever in my mind. So thank you for that, too. Uh, we know that we cannot achieve the goals of the Cancer Moonshot without ensuring equitable access to the whole continuum of cancer care. So it is now my pleasure to welcome Candace and her panel to the stage to discuss how we should ad address disparities in colorectal cancer. Okay, all right, so what we had discussed, we're gonna have to throw out the window because they've now have taken us to 30 minutes, so. All right, um, so we are here to address healthcare, um, I guess, what are we, disparities in colorectal cancer and healthcare. 
And that's a tough subject to tackle in 30 minutes, but we're going to do our best, right? So, I mean, pretty much the panel that was before us, we can actually pass the collection plate because they really touched on a lot of things, right? Uh, but I think what it is, I think it's important that we do touch on this subject. And so, but before I do that, I'd like to ask my panel to introduce themselves, starting with... Hi, everyone. I'm Matthew McCurdy, uh, co-founder and president of Black Health. We're an organization focused on reducing, mitigating the impact of racism on health outcomes and building solutions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fola May. I'm a gastroenterologist and health services researcher at UCLA Health and in the Veterans Affairs. Uh, good afternoon. It's on? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McRae. I'm the Associate Administrator for Primary Healthcare at HRSA within HHS, and we oversee the Community Health Center Program, FQHCs, for those who are not familiar. Buenas tardes. My name is Elmer Huerta. I'm the Director of the Cancer Preventorium at the George Washington University Cancer Center here in Washington, D.C. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So, Dr. May, I'm going to start with you. Sure. So we discussed um, safety net hospitals. Yes. Can you talk to us about the trouble that we're facing with safety net hospitals and how it affects uh, colorectal cancer screening and uh, the communities of color that it's affecting? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. And I'm so excited that we get to touch on this topic. So obviously in this country there are so many different areas where you can um, receive health care. And safety net hospitals, our federally qualified health care systems, are places where generally are providing care for people who are low income, uh, low socioeconomic background, maybe lack insurance or have low quality health care insurance. These are very delicate structures for health care delivery, and they are challenged by many competing demands of their patients. I am very blessed to do research in these settings where they are, were crippled by COVID, but even before that, challenge with how to provide preventive health services to the many patients that they, that they have given all of their needs. Particularly with colorectal cancer screening, it's a fragmented system. So many of these systems cannot offer colonoscopic screening. They do offer stool-based screening and other screening tests that can be performed at home. And we're lucky that we have access to these effective screening measures. But they are two-step screening processes. And what I mean by that is that if you have an abnormal stool-based screening test, you require a colonoscopy to complete the screening process. And many of these federally qualified health centers, safety net hospitals, have struggles in getting their patients into a setting where they can complete this colonoscopy in a timely manner. That presents a challenge of more cancer diagnoses, and unfortunately, as data has supported now, more deaths from colorectal cancer. So not only are we working in these settings on bringing their screening rates, and in some of them, their, lo their screening rates are as low as 18, 20% that I work in, but we're also working on the cancer care continuum, including follow-up after normal screening and cancer care for these patients who are diagnosed with cancer. That's amazing. So when we talk about that, and the need for research dollars combating inequity. What do you mean by that? To me again? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the research dollars are essential in this setting. We do not know how to effectively deliver care and preventive services with these, to these populations unless we do deep dives into these particular settings to understand how to best deliver that care. This is not a pick a model and apply broadly approach. Uh, as was mentioned in the previous panel, we need to go to the people, and we need to go to the people with the methods that work for that particular setting, and that's going to be different in every community. Uh, we speak specifically about African American or black communities, and I know Matthew will be talking about the work that Black Health does. I like to make sure that we pluralize that. It's black communities because you are not gonna treat every black community the same. The resources that are needed to get them screened are gonna vary. So the research dollars help us do that. By funding the work that we do in federally qualified health centers and in community-based settings, we learn the best ways to provide the screening tests, the follow-up care, and the cancer services. Awesome, awesome. So, speaking of meeting the people where they are, Dr. Horta, you do great work in the Latino community and especially um, your cancer preventorium program, which we discussed. Can you talk a little bit about that and community engagement? Sure. Cancer preventorium is an idea that started approximately 30 years ago 
Yeah, when I was a medical oncologist in training. Uh, I was giving chemotherapy to my patients, but almost all of them died because they had such an advanced disease when they presented to my clinic. And talking to these people, I started to realize that the main problem was that they were not really knowing what screening and prevention was. So it was very heartbreaking to find preventable conditions like a cervical cancer, like a breast cancer, like colorectal cancer, too advanced to be cured. So I started to find out that what people were really in need of was information, good information, science-based, evidence-based information. So I started a radio program 30 plus years ago here in Washington, DC, and my radio show has been on the air every single day, Monday through Friday, since th uh, 1989. Just pro talking about prevention, talking about early detection, but not only on cancer, but in many different uh, aspects of health. So 27 years ago, I started a clinic at the Washington Hospital Center where I was working at that time. But I told my listeners, if you want to see me, there's one condition for you to come to see me. You need to be free of symptoms because what we are going to do is to talk about prevention. And I'm going to do a screening according to the guidelines that we have in the United States. If you are sick, you can come, but I'm going to refer you to the doctor next door. So for my surprise, we have seen thousands of people, almost 40,000 people in these years, 95% of them without symptoms or with menial symptoms. That is the cancer preventorium, which is the opposite of the old sanatoriums, remember in the history of public health, where people used to go and die. So the idea is that we, in this part of the world, we have hospitals as the cathedrals of health. What we need to do, as they say in politics, some politicians, they know this very well, all politics, politics is local. In the same way, all public health is local. So what we need to do, both community health centers and hospitals, is not to wait for the person who's going to knock on our door, I'm sick, would you please take care of me? What we need to do is to go out to the community. Different communities, they have different solutions. Mm -hmm. At the hospital I used to work, we found out that they have doubled the national rate of breast cancer and colorectal cancer. And you know what? 99% of those people who presented late they had health insurance in their pockets, 99%. Yeah. So what was going on? What we needed to do was to educate these people. We have a cadre of community health workers. We went out to the community with our money keys. We showed them what the colon was. We showed them, and come here, touch, this is the polyp. They touch these plastic bottles of polyps, and they said, do I have that? You may. Do you want to sign up for this FOBT? We took the name, the address, the telephone number, and they had a high return rate of these FOBTs. The idea is that we need to get out, but in different communities with ambassadors of, of health in the local communities. So you agree that community engagement should be a standard? More than a standard, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't see any difference, for example, between my good trained GI doctors, my good trained nurses, etc., in the hospital and people in the community. Mm -hmm. They are the same level. Yeah. They are just talking different languages and they have, they have different messages and different uh, scopes of work, mm -hmm. but are the same. Absolutely. So in the previous panel, and uh, Simone has eloquently shared that access to information is a huge issue, right? And so how do we get communities that are missing information? Because we know that sometimes when information comes out, it comes out at a certain level. But communities, low-income communities and underserved communities and communities of color often miss information. So with a boots-on-the-ground approach, and I think you and I spoke about doing guerrilla work, right? 
What does that look like? How do we get information in the hands of people that actually need it? And so when we, and we talk about too, with that information, how do we educate our young people along with this? Because especially with the rates of colorectal cancer being increased uh, in the next seven years. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll briefly state that we started advocating about early age onset in 2006. And we were advocating and saying that in 2006, early age onset colorectal cancer was a thing. And we were told there was not enough data to support it. And so now here we are in 2023, and that is going to be the leading cause of cancer death. We have a problem with listening. So how do we get people to listen? In the communities and within the government. You asked like three questions. I'm trying I know, to know. <laughs> but I know you can handle it. <laughs> but I know you can handle it. Yeah. So, you know, I think first thinking about community and how we get people in the community the information, you know, Black Health really aims to serve as that translator, right? We want to take the data, we want to take the information and bring that to the community in a way that's really tangible. And I think it's really important to, when I think about communications, I think about the message, I think about the messenger, and I also think about the setting in which the message is given. Yes. And so we are, we are a messenger, but we also partner with community organizations who know their communities, who know that what's happening on the ground, to then deliver that message in a way that's going to reach them. And so I can't go to Houston, Texas. You know, I think about our, our partner in Houston, Texas. Uh, there is a large cancer belt there. I can't go to Houston, Texas with a message that's based in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from. I need to be, uh, I need to know what, what they need to hear. Um, and so I work with organizations who know that. Secondly, when you think about the setting, we know that black people have difficulties getting access to physician, to doctors uh, for a, a whole host of reasons, um, sort of structured by the way that racism operates in this country. And so uh, either there's a stigma around going or they actually don't have a physical presence in their communities. And so we plan, host events and communities. We show up at other events that are happening in these communities and deliver these messages. We actually deliver physical fit kits and then provide them with a wraparound uh, follow-up services and care in, in hopes that they, if tested positive, will then come back um, and, and deliver that result to us. So I think we have to be really intentional about understanding people. And that last panel really talks about that, right? We can't provide a solution that's just gonna blanket and cover everybody. We have to be nuanced in our approaches, nuanced in the way that we deliver them, and then who delivers that message as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So now, Jim, so you deal with funding with the uh, healthcare system. Can we talk about that? And speak on the, on the fact that when we talk about funding, especially for safety net hospitals, how can we increase that funding? How can we assure that funding for organizations, for community hospitals and settings are not reduced but increased? How do we work that? How do we, how do we reduce the disparities within these clinics so that we can have more because we have clinics that are closing, especially in low-income communities. So how do we how do we fix that? That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, not a simple one <laughs> to tricky. answer. It's multifactorial. <laughs> I will talk specifically about FQHCs, so federally qualified health centers. The mission of community health centers is grounded in health equity. That is yes. the reason why we exist. 90% um, of our patients live below 200% uh, of the poverty line. Two-thirds of our patients are racial and ethnic minorities. 20% are uninsured. We see over a million people who are experiencing homelessness, agricultural workers, residents of public housing. So our whole mission and commitment is around equity. With respect to colorectal cancer, I think there's three things that really have come to the forefront. One is leadership, and that's at the national level. You know, having the president talk about the cancer moonshot gives us a kickstart. But it also happens at the state level, and of course it happens at the local level and it happens in the clinics and in the hospitals. A second thing is focus, so being focused, that this is important, that you're gonna measure it, that you're actually gonna make a difference in this area. And then third is the whole issue around funding, and we were very pleased that just last year, we were able to receive about $5 million to support increased cancer screening in our health centers. And the partnership that we asked our health centers to do was directly with national cancer centers all across the country. That funding was doubled this year, um, which was just announced by the First Lady, 
And in the President's budget, it's actually being doubled again. And why it gets doubled is because you can show results, that it makes an impact, that it actually shows that things can change and things can get better. So we're very excited about that. The other piece of the President's budget for us is actually that whole issue of extended hours. So there actually are additional resources to get out into the community, which is a huge another issue that I want to talk about when we have some time. Too. Awesome, awesome. So we often talk about disparities, but when, we, when we're doing that, we're, we're not often considering rural communities that often. We're not talking about it enough. We, we touch on it, but we're not talking about it enough. Um, LGBTQ plus populations uh, and persons with disabilities. So how do we include that in the numbers, right? How do we make sure that everyone is being accounted? We know that we have a problem. We know we have a problem within minority medically underserved communities. That's, a, you know, that, that's not something we need to account. But how do we fix it? How do we fix access to transportation? So if you had a message to take home, because I don't know how much time we have left, mm -hmm. what's your take home message about this? How do we fix it? What can you tell the audience that we have here that will make a difference that you think and that you see is possibly a tried and true way to help reduce disparities within rural communities in addition to uh, minority medically underserved communities, the disability community, and the LGBTQ plus community. And anyone can take that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start us off by emphasizing the need for metrics. So particularly when we talk about um, many of these communities, but I'll focus on the LGBTQT plus community first, we do not have numbers. Mm -hmm. We do not measure uh, gender identity. So the first thing we need to do is change all the forms that exist in the government and in the clinics and in the hospitals. Because unless we have metrics to support that there are differences and disparities, we cannot find solutions and then we cannot disseminate those solutions. I think for rural populations, there are grave challenges in getting access to care and I'm gonna highlight access to high quality care because not all care is the same. Mm -hmm. I think there is an incredible role for things like patient navigation, which is now tried and true in the literature that it's effective, and it can particularly be affected in underserved populations. This is the idea that someone might need um, access to a test, or access to the follow-up care, or even access to the cancer screen or the cancer treatment, but needs someone to guide them. Sometimes it's a doctor, sometimes it's a nurse. Sometimes it's a lay person. We work with promotores in our Latino community in Los Angeles. These are individuals who are part of the community that can step in and talk to a patient who had an abnormal fit or cologuard about how to get into that colonoscopy, explain that it's not so bad, and walk them through the prep process. Awesome. Yeah, so um, two methods that I've seen, particularly for rural populations in Georgia. Um, Georgia is dealing with a number of different issues related to rural health, uh, largely from the closing of our rural hospitals. And so um, a, a high-tech solution first, uh, we've seen uh, the use of mobile vans that have a virtual care service uh, that will go around to communities, conduct screening, have a gastro um, online uh, to then deliver that result, but also to make recommendations for care. And then a low-tech solution would then be a, a follow-up text message service, right? We know that people are texting, that they're getting text messages um, to deliver health reminders and health information, right? And so if I can enroll someone in a campaign uh, that gives them reminders about healthy eating, that reminds them that, hey, last year you got this fit, it's time to get another one, um, here's the link to a resource to then go get that fit, um, I think that's a second way that we can really uh, try to get people access to, us, to the health system when there's not one physically there in their community. Awesome. Awesome. I, I would just add, I think there's two things that I see. One is we need to make cancer screening just a routine part of what we do in primary health care, especially colorectal cancer screening. So we need to increase the awareness of our providers, of our staff, of the patients, that it's just an expectation that every time they do come in, you're going to get a fit test, you're going to get it with a self-addressed stamped envelope to send it back so you have that. Patient navigators are absolutely critical. That's what helps get people through the system and into the system and then navigate it once a positive test comes about. But you can't stop there. You've got to get out into the community. So we are having our National Association of Community Health Centers meeting, and the way they described it is we need to figure out how to get outside the four walls of our clinic. Awesome. We need to figure out how to get out into the community. That's what we found with COVID around vaccines was we didn't start to make a difference until we went out into the community, listened. We had community health workers. We had promotoras. 
And we talked to them about what the impact was. And we talked about how serious it was. And we talked about why it was important. And so creating those opportunities and making it as easy as possible for people to be able to do this. Yeah, well, you know, COVID. They kind of messed up during COVID. <laughs> kind, of a, kind of a lot. <laughs> you know, but they also exposed that if they want to, people can be very creative, right? Because there, was a, there were a lot of mobilizations that happened during COVID that has not happened before. So when we think about that, Let's talk about the crisis that we're having with the early age onset. So I have a couple of questions with this, right? So we have early age onset that's on the rise. I was early age onset. I didn't have access. I had insurance, but equity, inequity, and implicit bias is what kept me from receiving the care that I should have had. So we're finding that more and more within our young population. We're telling people to be pre and pro. We're telling them to be preactive, I mean, a pre, uh, preventative and proactive, but yet our systems are not preventative and proactive. So that message is a mixed message. So we're telling our young people, if you're having symptoms, to come into the hospital, yet they're being dismissed. They're having implicit bias. They're not being able to be screened. So how are we trying to fix our system? How can we, what is the message here? because it seems like we're giving mixed messaging by saying, you know, we have this crisis, we have this issue, but yet we're pushing people out the door. We're ignoring their symptoms. We're ignoring them for six months, almost a year. So we have a multi-pronged problem. So with that being said, when we think about technology and we think about advancement and treatment, if we're telling people to be pre and pro, but yet our systems are not pre and pro, is that helping health equity, or is it making it worse? Anybody can tackle that. <laughs> well, I think one way to do it, that's a very tricky. Yeah, I think uh, that was tricky. <laughs> but I think, I think again, I, I like to dream and think, imagine that we have community health centers, we have hospitals, we have all these centers, that wonderful centers we have all over the United States, that they have the mandate and the resources to have community health workers and people going to the local communities at different hours, evenings, Saturdays, Sundays, different, different concept. It's not a nine to five. And there, at the community level, these ambassadors of health, they would talk about colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, heart disease. They would talk about many other things. So what I'm trying to dream is a system, as you said before, that should be a standard, that provides health education to the public. Using not only people, community health workers, et cetera, at the local level, but the media that we have now. Why is that, for example, all these new social media are so successful among people because they provide messages that they like and they get addicted to, to the TikToks and all that stuff. Why cannot we have something like that for people too? So what we need to think is out of the box, using that kind of media to reinforce the work that people can do at the local level. Again, I think what we need to do is somehow think in a model by which we need to get out of the hospital, the center. We cannot keep waiting for people to come knock on our door because they will have advanced disease. It just breaks our hearts that one out of four people, yeah, yeah, one out of four people, <laughs> yeah, one out of four people go, who goes to the hospital now they have advanced colorectal cancer awesome. in the lungs and the liver. Yes. That's heartbreaking. It and is. one out of f four people. It is, it is. And I'm, and I'm sorry, we only have two minutes left, so. I'll, I'll be really quick. <laughs> I, I think technology can either exacerbate the current disparities or make them better. And it really depends on how the technology is designed. Is it designed from the perspective of a patient and a person? And is it thinking about the potential for creating more disparities? Or is it just being designed to benefit honestly, the organizations. And I think really changing the focus around being more patient-centered um, is what's critical, and human-centered design in terms of our work. 
And I think that question and this topic is so important because we are at a rapidly changing landscape for colorectal cancer, not only in who it's presenting and how, but also in the technologies that are about to hit the stage. Yeah. So if we don't consider equity as we roll out those technologies, we will worsen disparities. Absolutely. Awesome. So what does health equity look like? Uh, what does health equity look like? What does health equity look like? So I'd say all health for all people. Um, we know that the social determinants of health have an impact on health outcomes. And so we should think of health as housing. We should think of food access as health, right? These are the things that have a true contribution to our health outcomes. Uh, we must continue to have a holistic approach and a multifaceted approach of how we address health healthcare. Awesome. So thank you all so much. I just realized I never introduced myself. So. <laughs> they told me I had 30 minutes. I was like, okay, let me just get to talking here. So, so I'm Candace Henley. I am a 20 year survivor of colorectal cancer. I was diagnosed at 35. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is such an honor to be here. I'm also the founder of the Blue Hat Foundation, which, is a, which serves minority and medically underserved communities. Uh, and uh, we are heavily engaged in raising awareness and education of colorectal cancer and partnering with our community health clinics uh, and partnerships with like a, a Colon Cancer Alliance and Fight Colorectal Cancer and anyone else that wants to raise awareness of colorectal cancer. And I'm also a mom of five fabulous daughters who are um, watching. Hi, guys. So thank you all so much for having us. And thank you so much for your insight and sharing information as to how our officials and our systems and our industry partners can do better in raising awareness of not only colorectal cancer, but also helping us with the early age onset population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candace, and the entire panel. I think you really helped us understand better how we must do better, must do better for our different communities, especially our different black communities with an S. Thank you, Fola, for that. Um, and also our LGBT communities, our rural communities, and of course, our disabled communities. We started these panels discussing the importance of screening. And now we're going to pivot to, treat, to treatment and the second mission critical objective of the Cancer Moonshot, which is supporting patients and their families. Please join me in welcoming Nilo and her panel to discuss colorectal cancer treatment, innovation, and support. Welcome. Well, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank um, the Biden Cancer Administration, um, Biden Cancer, the Biden Administration, um, as well as the Cancer Moonshot for um, everything that they have done to be advocating for the cancer community and colorectal cancer for well over a decade. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today on this panel. I'm Nilo Azad. I'm a professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins, and my clinical work is really focused on taking care of patients with colorectal cancer, especially early onset and metastatic patients. Um, and I've run our drug development program, our phase one program there for many years as well. Please introduce yourself for everyone on the panel and tell us how you are connected to the mission of improving outcomes for colorectal cancer. Um, my name is RF Nathu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a technology company called Komodo Health. Uh, we focus on uh, taking a look into uh, patient journeys across the entire U.S. So we track the journeys of over 300 million patients. We see how they experience healthcare in this country, and we seek to understand what that means to them and what we can learn as policymakers, uh, hospitals, insurers, drug developers, patient advocates uh, to improve quality of life and healthcare outcomes. Hi, I'm Fun Gallagher. I am uh, the president of the Colon Club. We focus on the early age onset that's diagnosed under 45 population. Um, I'm also the research advocacy program manager with Fight Colorectal Cancer, and I am a stage four 15 year rectal cancer survivor.
My name is Alad Sharon. I'm a medical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute, uh, where I actually work uh, also on early drug development in um, our phase one clinic. But primarily what I work on is a national program of immunotherapy and other targeted therapy drug development uh, that we run at up to 2,000 sites uh, throughout the United States, um, uh, all funded by uh, taxpayer dollars through the NCI. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I feel that we uh, obviously need to do more for colorectal cancer in general um, uh, through these networks and through these efforts uh, because uh, clearly um, uh, what we've done thus far is not enough. My name is Kathy Ng. I'm a professor at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. I am the co-director of uh, GI Oncology and the co-leader of the GI research program at, at uh, Vanderbilt. I conduct clinical research, and on behalf of the NCI, um, I am the co-chair of the GI steering committee. So my primary focus is colorectal cancer and especially early onset. So, Dr. Ang, I'm going to start with you. Um, there has been such progress in understanding the biology of colorectal cancer over the last 10 or 15 years. So where would you say that the science in terms of treatment of patients is most exciting right now when it comes to colorectal cancer? That's a great question. I think the most important um, uh, steps moving forward have been primarily focused on personalized medicine or precision oncology. Um, but what is happening is precision oncology is wonderful, but we're breaking down um, colorectal cancer into very small subsets. And as a result, um, we really need uh, patients to enroll to clinical trials. We have to screen a lot of patients. You'll see that one of the drugs that recently just got approved um, only impacts less than 4% of all colorectal cancer patients. So we have to screen so many patients to identify those individuals. And we have to find ways to get patients into clinical trials. I mean, to date, um, less than 10% of all patients enroll into clinical trials, and we, we need to find other methods, and I think Fong is going to talk about that uh, moving forward, including telehealth as well as other ways to make our lives easier for our patients so they have access and we can work with them to enroll to clinical trials. Yeah, I think we really need to leverage technology in this space because when you look at COVID, one of the things that happened was we were able to use telehealth across state lines. And that really allows for the access for people who are in the rural communities, those who don't have the ability to travel to these NCI centers to get <coughs> access to the trials. And now that the, those emergency provisions has ended, we've completely moved backwards. We're back to having to either travel to those centers and we don't get reimbursed for travel, we don't get reimbursed for all the cost of time lost from work. Um, all these factors really weigh in, especially when you're living paycheck to paycheck. So when we're talking about access and affordability, we have to make sure that everybody can get into these trials at, at like you said, the quality of care. And I think it's important, and we were talking earlier, it's really important to keep in mind when you have um, a rare cancer, you may have a randomized phase two study, but for all phase three trials, there's a control arm. And that control arm is the standard of care. So how can we incorporate the standard of care so patients can get access to their care with their local physician? There's great local community partners out there. Um, there's also great retail, we were talking about retail pharmacies. We work with, at, at Vanderbilt, we work with Walgreens on a regular basis. How can we incorporate um, working with these retail pharmacies and across state lines, every single state, all of a sudden it's different. I have to go get a different license now in every single state to do telehealth. And it's extremely expensive as well for a physician. Yeah, and, and I think that um, it, is, it is wonderful that the president is advocating for so much financial investment in cancer. Um, but we also have things like this, which are really low hanging fruit and doesn't cost much money because we know we can do it because when COVID happened, the entire medical system was able to flex to it. And, and in the last couple of years, that's changed completely since COVID has abated. Um, and you know, many professions, the legal profession has reciprocity of licensing, and that's all we need. Um, and if, if that could be done by um, executive order or by working with um, different state governments, it could, it's a very quick solution that would, in one moment, improve the quality of life and potential enrollment of patients in trials. So um, I'd really love to advocate for, for that being something that the administration takes on. Um, so Dr. Sharon, you know, we, Dr. Ng was just talking very much about how we need patients to enroll in clinical trials more. Um, can you talk a little bit about ways that we might be able to innovate how we do clinical trials? I mean, that's a big part of the NCI's mission, right? 
Certainly. Um, you know, bringing clinical trials to patients in their local communities has been something that we've done out for actually quite some time, usually through the cooperative groups, um, like SWOG, ECOG, NRG, and the Alliance, as well as the Children's Oncology Group. Um, as I was mentioning before, there are up to 2,000 of those um, uh, around the country and actually around the world. Um, the FDA recently came up with uh, something that they called Project Pragmatica, um, uh, that is also intended to facilitate that type of clinical trial uh, innovation, as it were, by taking at least some questions that we might be able to answer with a lighter footprint, less data collection, and essentially less cost, but still end up with answers that are deeply and Im important to patients. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that every trial has to be that way. Um, we obviously want to learn more and be able to utilize everything, every part of the clinical trial basically to learn more for our patients going forward. But in some instances, that's actually one way that we might be able to both lower costs, increase access, and improve outcomes for patients by actually finding the right clinical trial that might um, uh, be able to de-risk and um, uh, uh, de uh, accelerate some of the rapid um, uh, machinery that is actually, uh, over time, increased the cost overall for clinical trials generally. Um, uh, in industry, um, uh, I've heard um, estimates of uh, the cost of enrolling a patient is up to $100,000 and maybe more in some cases. Um, uh, so uh, that's a, a, on a per patient basis. That can be very expensive. And you mentioned, of course, also um, uh, the screening cost. <coughs> Um, uh, if, if there is some way that the NCI could potentially, um, you know, work almost as a, an honest broker, as it does in certain instances, NCI match and some other trials, where there might actually be able to be uh, joint screening with multiple different arms, that might also facilitate this new era where um, uh, smaller and smaller subpopulations of larger uh, groups um, uh, can be studied on a clinical trial, on a single clinical trial with a single screening procedure. So I would love for one of the two of you to just address the word screening, because we just talked a lot about screening in a totally different context. And so we're using the same word, but I think we're using it a little differently, yeah? We are certainly, and I, okay. I, I, I do apologize. So screening for a clinical trial as opposed to screening for colorectal cancer to begin with. Um, of course, we do have prevention clinical trials. Those are really important. Um, but in this context, yes, you're right. I'm talking talking about taking a patient, um, uh, finding their specific uh, mutations or markers or some features of their tumor and determining whether or not they should be enrolled on a specific aspect or arm of a clinical trial. Um, I, I do want to mention one thing, just tying into what you just stated. Um, the reality is, so I, I work on behalf of the NCTN or National Clinical Trials Network for the NCI, which is on behalf of the four cooperative groups. To date, um, in it's been over 21 years now I've been in practice, and the reimbursement rate for, for NCI-sponsored studies, especially for participation in these national NCTN studies, is extremely low. And you just stated it's, it's quite expensive based upon pharma numbers. The reality is because the compensation reimbursement is rather low, it hinders the interest from um, academic centers and other centers in participating in clinical trials. And as a result, it takes much longer to com um, complete a clinical trial. And as a result, pharmaceutical companies also are a little bit dissuade from participating specifically in NCI-sponsored studies. But yet we want these NCI-sponsored studies because these are the trials that pharmaceutical companies do not necessarily want to run. Um, whether it's about uh, repurposing drugs or um, whether it's about thinking about a, a symptom management um, and using novel approaches in that way. Um, so we really would love to partner, obviously, and with the NCI. We love the NCI. Let, let, let's, you know, let's be honest. It's just, you know, they are, they are also um, hindered by the fact that they have limited um, funding, but it really impacts our capabilities to um, complete clinical trials appropriately and to get people vested. Yeah, I think it really results in a lot of clinical trials being around expensive new drugs rather than solutions that are broader but, um, but don't end up being as financially um, viable for companies. Can, Fung, can you talk a little bit about what patients need to be able to, to participate in clinical trials? You know, Kathy mentions only 10%. What is happening and what could we do to help people participate in studies more? 
You know, we've talked about education and awareness today, and I think clinical trials is a huge, huge opportunity to talk about that. You know, um, a lot of people think, oh, clinical trial, that's the last thing you try before, you know, it's the last resort, you know, and it really isn't. It should not be. And there, there's a lack of knowledge in what it takes to enroll in a clinical trial. Just because you want to go there doesn't mean that there's a spot open or that you can get there because, or that you qualify through screening. So, you know, it's really important to know things like your biomarkers and to um, have conversations with your oncologist on what's available to you. But unfortunately, a lot of times, there are oncologists that go, well, I don't know of any clinical trials for you, and it ends there. Because the patients go onto the clinical trials website, and it is a monster to try to navigate. We don't speak med speak. And so to try to navigate that, to try to find the things that even fit you, it takes a lot of tenacity just to get through that. So if we can educate our patients on what it takes to get on it and why it's to their benefit to give it a try, I think that you'll see progress in enrollment and um, retention by, by the good screening. So Dr. Nathu, can you talk a little bit about how, like what is, we talk a lot about big data. What does big data in cancer mean? And then how can we use it to take care of patients better? Great question. Before when we used to do studies on how many patients had a certain disease, how they presented, what they looked like, we'd take a small sample of the country and we'd, in the entire discipline of epidemiology was born and we would sort of draw some statistical conclusions about the US. Uh, we're in this incredible era where data is not only available, but can be linked across different institutions, different care settings, different types. Like I can look at the race and ethnicity composition of a population and look at that against mortality and look against uh, like the entire journey of that patient. And when you start to do that at scale, you develop this incredible appreciation for just how much disparity affects colorectal cancer. It is. Uh, an incredible challenge for all of us when we see black patients you know, having delayed treatment from the point of diagnosis, when, when we think about this from the journey of predicting which patients are likely to have cancer, that a, a young black man is likely to show up in the emergency room with anemia and not get a colonoscopy compared to a white counterpart, we can use that to drive better intervention. Now, beautiful thing is we know where that's happening. This doesn't require precision oncology, precision medicine, it just, just says, let's just look. Let's just look at what's happening today. Can we make decisions? Can we actually say, maybe there's a very simple intervention that says, if, if somebody comes in with, with a certain presentation, let's test a low cost intervention to bring them to the table. And maybe there's a study that's in there. The ability for us to use data to drive that is incredible. Now, it took a global pandemic to get states and the federal government and private institutions to share data, but why don't we treat cancer like that? Why weren't we all sharing the data on who's presenting, how they're presenting, putting them into national registries, putting them into a way that researchers can get access to them, because that's what drives innovation in this country. That's what makes this country incredible. Uh, but we have a moral obligation, we have a duty uh, as Americans to do this for our population, and we think data is this incredible unlock, and we're in an age where it can be done. That's what's amazing about it. So I feel like you're talking a bit about real world data, right? And so I think there's um, both excitement and some controversy about how we can use real world data. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit from the panelists about the feelings about using data that isn't as well gathered as on a clinical trial where we have very tight requirements for data that's gathered, but using that to change the way that we treat patients or as our control arms as as Kathy, you were mentioning, you know, many clinical trials have to be compared to something, and the FDI, FDA has been very reticent to allow controls that are not gathered within the context of a clinical trial. So I'd love for us to spend a little bit of time on that. I'll say something to start with because I am in the real world data space. Yeah. So the FDA put out guidance uh, just at the beginning of February that lays out conditions for using uh, real world data in studies. It is incredible and it is going to drive a whole generation of research that can be done with data as control, which is so incredibly important for patients who, are, who may not get um, a life saving therapy. I think the broader question though is that there is sampling bias, there's bias in everything we do. There is bias in 
the data we receive from a provider, from a payer, from a patient panel, and correcting that bias is like literally the first action that any of us can take before we plug it into AI, before we talk about machine learning and large you know, LLMs, and before any of that, we have to address um, the bias in data. LMN? Oh, large language <laughs> models like ChatGPTs of the world, like the ability to like study, you know, large corpuses of information, sorry. Um, but, but it's just this whole idea that uh, when we systematically identify and address bias, then if you're training an AI off of that, you have far more confidence it actually reflects the dynamics of this country, of, of the folks on the ground that are having the experience of cancer. Just to you know, respond to that, I, I actually think that we have um, uh, a real failure um, on the part of um, uh, really uh, cancer research at this point that we're not utilizing the the potential that we have not only from the real world data perspective that but really just uh, the the fact that we have um, the potential for a learning health system within the cancer context and you know one example obviously is that um, you know we have uh, of course at the NCI I'm not going to give you the alphabet soup but we have a division that focuses on focuses on treatment and other uh, that focuses on prevention but also prevention of side effects and another that focuses on some of this big data work um, you know, epidemiology and things of that nature and looking at EMERS, electronic medical records and such. We could actually utilize uh, the patients that we're treating, patients that we're treating in the real world setting as well as patients that we're treating on clinical trials to better learn how to manage, control and deal with adverse events that are occurring because of our cancer treatment. Um, there are many that occur as a result um, of uh, colorectal cancer treatment. There are many patients that suffer from things like peripheral neuropathy, where they have pain in their, um, uh, the, the tips of their fingers, tips of their toes because of the treatment. And we've done virtually nothing to alleviate that pain and suffering related to cancer treatment over the course of decades. Now we're in this era at this point with targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and we have an, uh, some potential actually, not only to learn how to deal with these adverse events to help ameliorate the immediate uh, problems associated with treatment, but also to learn how we might be able to better understand resistance to therapy because normal tissue responds in many ways, unfortunately, similar to um, uh, cancer-related tissue. And we can use the information both from clinical trials, uh, electronic medical records, and such to, to, to better drive innovation in cancer. It's a missed opportunity and we need to be doing more for these patients. So I'm just going to echo a little bit and add on what you just mentioned regarding real-world data. I mean, the reality is you can take a lot of the our practice patterns as, as medical oncologists and, and incorporate it and um, it helps the patient in reducing their side effects. So, for instance, we, we know that the FDA insert for capecitabine is not what we would normally give a patient because it, it causes a lot of toxicity. We know that um, during the era of COVID, and actually many of us were doing this for many, many years, we were omitting 5-FU bolus um, and leucovorin because it results in myelosuppression. And so all of a sudden COVID happened and, and everyone's like, oh, maybe we should do that. Well, I've been doing it for over 10 years and so have many of our, my, our other colleagues, right? But we had to put that in publication, but that was real world data that helped change what is um, how patients are tolerating their, their therapy. Because, um, you know, being in practice, even though we're, none of us are in practice full time, right? We do clinical research, et cetera, um, it, we can give a lot of advice on what would be appropriate for a patient to, so they could tolerate their treatment better and it can prolong their survival. And from a real world data perspective, one of the things um, that we as patients look at is access to palliative care being very, very underutilized. You know, we talked about navigation earlier. Palliative care can connect you to mental health services, to pain management, to sexual health and dysfunction. And all these things are things that we talk about within the community, but so many people confuse palliative with hospice care and they think, oh my God, you're on palliative, you know, I'm, you know I, you're, you're, on, you're on limited clock, you know, and it really isn't. So I think that that's another area where we can identify through the data, this person needs some support services, how can we connect them? Yeah, I mean, I think on that front, one of the things that is a challenge with uh, clinical trials that deal with symptoms is that there's not much financial gain in them. And so they're just not areas where there's a lot of private development. Um, so I, I would love to hear what, 
What do you think stands in the way of doing those trials from a patient perspective, or do you think that it's purely just that they don't exist and they don't know about it? I think it's a combination of both. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, need for, for what's available out there. You know, when you're looking at trials, most of us think of something that's going to be saving my life. And, and in this world, it's precision medicine right now. But if it's something else, those trials typically get a little more lost. Um, so finding a patient champion, um, you know, we were talking about influencers earlier, you know, the patient community, we really talk to each other. And so, um, you know, I remember there was a drug that my oncologist had, had recommended to me because I had, um, you know, full fox and full fury and it failed me. And he kind of said, well, there's a new drug that just came out and I had already known about it because I was talking to my patient peers. And I, I was able to say, nope, not the quality of life I want, what's the next option? You know, and, and I was able to stand up and do that, but how many people don't do that? And this is an area where, where some of the kind of data aggregation methods that you use could be very helpful to, to see what practice patterns are and what works and doesn't work potentially, yeah? Absolutely. I think the beautiful thing about um, the way that we can trace journeys is that it, we can now get the data out of EHRs and out of like, uh, you know, payers, like the claims and like from testing companies, like where we can actually get genomic information and we can bring that all together to study these patterns. The problem is not one of interoperability. It's always been one of trust. Everyone feels like they're giving something up when they share data and they're not sure that you know, they're going to get something in return. And so uh, what we've had to really evolve is a set of mechanisms that get people to share in the name of public health. And then we share that with our advocacy partners. We share that with patient advocacy organizations that are really there to then help the patient navigate through those opportunities. So I feel like the quest is actually to get folks to share for public health and the government is the best mechanism to start driving that behavior in a system that reimburses private institutions very, very well for the care that they're providing. How do we make sure that that information then gets shared back so we can learn something, we can do something for patients? So we're big champions of that, and I feel like we're at that time when this has to be in the national consciousness, the discussion around how we use data to drive better care, and then how we use data to measure performance so we can set accountability for the work that we're doing. Kathy, you had mentioned precision medicine, and that is an, you know, an area where we can match patients based on their biomarker with therapy. But now with, with technology really being able to create groups of patients that aren't based on just one mutation, and where there isn't already a company or many companies set up that do that work, what do you think the obstacles are right now to being able to translate all of this biological work that we're and knowledge that we're gaining into how we select patients? What do we need to invest in now? Oh my gosh, that is such such a, a great question. Um, I think the number one thing we need to invest in is we need to still educate patients about the importance of molecular testing. I'm still seeing a lot of my patients that come into my clinic that have not been tested, and that can make a huge difference in their treatment because they are potential actionable mutations. Um, honestly, really just focusing, I think, from my perspective, always, in order to make greater advances, we need more people to enroll to clinical trials, and we need people to feel more comfortable. Um, some people are concerned that they have the term mutation does sound scary, but in fact, it is, it's a molecular alteration um, for the majority of our patients, and in fact, it can help you um, as a patient in regards to treatment options. Um, I personally believe that we really need to still educate our patients, as well as educate our treating um, physicians out in the community, and also the, there's multiple companies, that you, as you mentioned, the reports that are provided by the various companies, some are very complicated and very difficult to interpret, and sometimes that treating physician and the patient um, who's trying to be informed does not understand what it means, and that actually can obviously serve as an obstacle. So I really loved the question from the earlier moderator about what you would do if you had a billion dollars. Um, and I think it's particularly important when we're talking about innovation. So um, I'm going to increase it because this is government, so we can do more than a billion. So, <laughs> but if, if we, I mean, if we had five billion dollars um, and we were going to invest in something that was going to really innovate how patients are treated or give patients what they need to improve their treatment journey, what do you think that, that we should be investing in? Well, 
speaking from where I sit, we should be democratizing access to the data that will help folks get to treatment faster and better, to highlight the disparities, to address them, to share across public and private institutions, to be open about that, and to do it for patients. Um, and I would devote a big chunk of that to driving that policy change and then ensuring that we hold all private uh, institutions accountable. You know, I keep going back to earlier panels and the things that we've talked about. Getting into the communities is important. Um, the government can put out PSAs. You know, we, we looked at smoking campaigns way back and look at the effect that it has had now. So if we normalize colon, rectum, you know, these words are, should not be scary to say and to talk about. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not, it shouldn't be something that's shameful or have a stigma to it, right? So if we have these educational pieces with the PSAs, if we get into the communities and we provide the support throughout the journey with these navigators, I think that you're going to see a tremendous impact and increase in diagnosis more earlier and treating um, those that are diagnosed later as well. Okay, so that's $2 billion. I've got three left, right? <laughs> so. Um, uh, so I think that um, uh, there are probably several things that I, I, I wish we could do. Um, uh, I think that we need to work more on endpoints. I think it was mentioned before, what, um, uh, and I've heard as almost an aphorism of science, what cannot be measured cannot be learned from. Um, we need to uh, learn more about circulating tumor DNA, which is one way that we might be able to use a particular endpoint that is more exact than many of the ones that we have right now, um, uh, potentially for screening at the screening that we talked about earlier, but also uh, uh, screening for metastasis um, uh, and evaluating patients for response to therapy. That can make a big difference, especially if we did it in a platform manner to better understand what types of uh, individual mutations or molecular alterations or other problems might actually um, uh, be able to um, uh, be detected in individuals so that we can subset them and find treatments that are appropriate for those patients in particular. I, I, I think very much that we do not do nearly enough in symptom science. We do not do nearly enough in immune-related adverse events. Immunotherapy hasn't worked quite as well in colorectal cancer, at least microsatellite satellite stable colorectal cancer. Um, but it, it's important to note that just a few weeks ago, um, uh, there was a, an approval um, for rectal cancer for patients that have MSI high status, a particular type of status, that essentially um, uh, resulted from a very, very small clinical trial um, out of uh, a Memorial Sloan Kettering that showed that, that patients um, uh, who received um, a, a particular immunotherapy um, uh, had functional cures, did not need surgery, did not need uh, radiation or chemotherapy for their rectal cancer. And uh, it's really just a testament to what we can do if we find the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And obviously we need to do that um, uh, among other things, but I guess I, I've used up two billion, so I think you've got. <laughs> so if there's any left, anything left of the one billion left or yeah. half a billion left, I'll take it. Um, what I would like to see, number one, is improved access overall for individuals, not only in regards to education, um, but because that would help with screening and awareness, but also, once again, trying to incorporate telehealth, trying to work with our retail pharmacies to learn um, how we can include them in the process of clinical trial enrollment so we can get these trials completed quicker and faster, so we can get more advances. But more importantly to me, from my role, I would love to have greater reimbursement, nothing against the NCI, but I would love to have greater reimbursement for our NCI-sponsored um, studies because currently um, we have lots of great thought leaders amongst the cooperative groups, and we need to have more institutions engaged with the NCI, um, NCTN clinical trials process so um, we can have these trials completed once again. Um, that's what I would like to see. Um, and then pharma companies would give us more of their more novel therapies. They'd be more vested. Yeah, and I think the, the wonderful thing about that solution is that w while it's not low-hanging fruit financially, it is low-hanging fruit in terms of it really just is a dollar investment that, that could really make a meaningful difference. Um, I'm going to answer my own question as well that um, I'm, I really feel like a passion for trying to get trials into patients' communities. I think we need to really work with community oncology. People should not have to travel to academic centers to have access. Um, that 
that makes a huge difference when it comes to rural communities, when it comes to communities of color, but also all communities. People shouldn't have to travel um, so far to be involved in clinical trials. And so a national dialogue on that that comes both from the NCI and brings in private partnerships. There's some private companies that are working really excitingly in this space. Um, but I, I really think people should be able to be taken care of in their homes um, and, and still be able to get top-notch research. So um, I think that we are out of time. Um, this has been a fantastic panel. Thank you so much for the invitation. That brings us to the, the end of our program today. I heard a lot of progress, heart, and hope but I also heard a lot, uh, I heard a lot about how much we have left to do. And so I'm gonna take Simone's guidance at the start and not be overwhelmed by that, <laughs> by the daunting task ahead, um, and instead charge all of us to focus on how the world must be different when we come together again next March as part of Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, to have made our precious time together here worthwhile. What success for today looks like is that we each take the charge and ideas that our panels so expertly provided and turn that into action. And we stand at the ready to yell that from the rooftops and shine a light on all of the great work that you're doing. So we have to hold ourselves accountable to delivering new resources, programs, policies that impact people's lives throughout this year, the rest of this year and beyond. Only then can we live up to the goal and the mission that the president has given all of us, uh, to end cancer as we know it together. So thank you. Uh, with that, we will close.